I'm Kay Wendleton, CEO of the Five O'Clock Club. This is our 49th HR Network Breakfast. Um, we have a great, great program for you today, and as you can see, we have a packed house. Um, I want to say that we owe it to our HR customers, that is the HR prof professionals who use us for executive coaching or for outplacement. It's because of them that we are able to put on these events for free, these terrific events for free. And so we just want to applaud our HR customers for you know, using us and allowing you to have this. You know, our HR customers are heroes in their organization for having chosen the 5 o'clock club. We get so many thank you notes a day from HR professionals. And you can be a hero, too. Think about this. Every employee in your organization gets one year of outplacement. Even the lowest level clerk gets one year of outplacement. Who does that? Who does that? The prices are ridiculously cheap. It costs, you know, the same as a two-day seminar elsewhere. Senior execs, for a price that's very affordable, can have three years of outplacement, including 62 hours of private coaching guaranteed and three years of small group strategy sessions. Why do we do that? We do that because they need it. They need it to turn that job search coaching into on-the-job coaching that can last for, you know, a few years. The typical senior exec at the year and a half point is having problems in his or her job. And so that three-year program might sound ridiculous, but it's guess what? They choose it. They choose it over space. They would rather have that kind of on-the-job coaching. Guess what? If they lose that job, they don't like that job, and this goes for everybody. If they lose their next job, don't like that next job, we help them find another one. Who does that? Nobody does that. Um, plus, the package can be extended for any reason. That is, a person takes a consulting assignment, they decide to take care of some family issues, whatever. They can extend their package. We automatically extend the package by six months and then another six months. By the way, this goes for retail clients as well. I'll tell you about retail in a minute. You're going to hear from one of them. <clears throat> We report to you monthly on the status of the person's search. Are they using your money well or are they not? And so you get, we track them down. If they're not showing up, we track them down. What are they, are they sitting home depressed? Look, this is the opposite of the typical outplacement mentality, which is we're here if you need us. You, we're here, call us if you need us. And if you don't call us, well, I hate to say it, so much the better. Anyway, I'm not, that's not true for everybody, but I'll tell you how many people track people down. We track down your employees and say, how are you doing? Do you need a different coach? How are you feeling? Why don't you come on back? Nobody else does that. And, we, and you get a monthly report to make sure your money is being well spent. And speaking of spending money well, we pay our coaches three to four times what they would earn at a traditional outplacement firm. And this means that we can insist that our coaches go through a four-month certification process so they can unlearn the things they think they know about coaching and job search and executive coaching and learn instead what the research proves. This also means that our coaches are incented to want to work with your employees as opposed to fine, show up, don't show up. We're paying them you know, from $110 to $200 an hour to, and they only get paid when they work with your employees. So that's a quite an incentive. Need I say more? No, I need not say more, but I will say more. Um, we're going to hear in one second from John Erdinetta, who was a retail client. Now, historically, half of those who attend the club come in on their own. They are self-referred. And why do we do that? We do that because, you know, we want to make this terrific service available to the general public, not just to those whose companies provide outplacement. That's number one. And number two, it's a healthier environment. It's a healthier environment for the job hunter to have a mix of self-referred people as well as people who are sent by their employers. Um, also, by the way, we don't kick people out when they're having a long, difficult search. We don't say, oh, well, bye, we've done our best, you're on your own. No, no, no. We try to get them back. We extend their time. Who else does that? Nobody else does that. Oh, well, let's hear from John right now. Just as you would hear him report at the club on his successful search, so John Erdinetta, let's give him a round of applause for coming here and reporting today. Yay! That's what we do at the club, too. We give him applause. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is John Erdinetta. I'm a senior IT professional with over 11 years of experience, eight of which has been at the big four, Price Woodhouse Coopers, uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, delivering global, regional, and country solutions on the Microsoft and IBM technologies. I have a proven track record 
working closely with the executives and partners, and I re recently accepted an offer at Ernst & Young as a technical lead. So how did I learn about the Five O'Clock Club? Uh, I was at Ernst & Young. I've been there actually for quite some time now as a contractor, as a consultant. And about a year ago, there was a company policy to cut back on the consultants. And they were going to, specifically within IT at that time, they were going to start bringing in an offshore vendor. Um, I found out about the club. I'd heard about it many years before, but never attended. And I decided this time I wanted to attend because I heard so much about it. Uh, when I attended the club and started, you know, went through the lectures and the books, I started to learn more about the, like a methodology on career planning and job searching, which I found very uh, uh, structured and, and interesting. Then in, in my mind, I went through, they have some exercises like the seven stories, uh, the 40-year vision, uh, which you know, gave me confidence and uh, provided some guidance on my decisions. And initially, I decided, you know what? I want to work in Colombia. You know, there's like the emerging markets. Uh, somewhere I could use my skills and my passion. Uh, my parents are from Colombia. I was born here in New York. And then through the small groups and the information exchange was also part of the first hour, uh, I was able to develop my targets through networking contacts and um, also through starting to participate in networking associations. Uh, in the meantime, I, I, still, I also networked heavily at Ernst & Young. And at the very last day since I was networking, I got my name out there and I had more confidence and I was actually connecting with people, I landed a, a, a project on the very last day that I was gonna get let go as a, as a consultant. <laughs> Literally, got a call like at 3 p.m. <laughs> Do you know this technology? I'm like, yes, I'm excellent. Okay, good, you're staying. <laughs> and initially I was an application engineer on, on the project and then I moved up and I actually became the technical lead on the project. And, uh, and I still attended the sessions and I still, uh, Actually, I was using the sessions even to help me with my current uh, job situations, not just for my job search. Um, and then they, they approached me with some interest, and they said, you know, they wanted me to, you know, apply, and, but I was still working, and, and I wasn't sure yet because I still had, you know, you know this uh, vision out to work in Colombia. And then I, I went ahead and applied it anyway because, you know, after a while, them asking you, you know, they're, they're not going to wait for you forever, right? So, so I applied, and then I went through, you know, through the interview process, and I used a lot of the, the techniques I learned at the 5 o'clock club, such as uh, think like a consultant, uh, determine what the objections are, and uh, follow up with what are called influencing letters, not follow-up letters, and then finally the salary negotiations where I actually got a lot of, you know, a lot of help from my uh, coach, Chip. And, uh, you, know, make, you know, essentially, the, it, it's essentially, especially with the salary negotiations, I... I you know, they, they teach you to uh, always say it's not a problem. <laughs> it's not a, you know, defer, yeah, defer it to the end, and I, and I did that successfully. And I'm very happy with my offer, and I started on April 4th. And <laughs> and uh, even though I'm, I'm on Ernst & Young, I, what I, I'm taking away from this, it wasn't just finding another job, which I was doing before, which is, you know, jumping from contract to contract. Now I feel I have more focus and actually a, a career path, which is something I think nowadays you, really, you don't really get from companies and you have to uh, do it on your own. And I, felt, I feel that the, the, the Five O'Clock Club has you know, given me these you know, life skills that I continue, I'm gonna continue using my life and now through Ernst & Young, I'm gonna try and figure out how to get to Columbia. Yay. Oh, thank you so Yay. much. <laughs> You know, it's funny, that's what we say. We don't, landing that first job is, that doesn't mean success. We want to know what the person's dream is and we want to keep on working with them. Let's hear from Chip Conlin, who was John's coach. I actually like standing up here because it means another one of our members landed, which is always good news. <laughs> um, at the Five O'Clock Club, one of the presentations that we give is on advanced interviewing techniques. And uh, we talked about the importance of taking on the role of a consultant, both in preparing for and actually going on the interview. And no one could have uh, done that better than John did. In fact, as he mentioned to you, he actually was a consultant when he started out there. And um, as, an, as a consultant and internal to the company, he was able to work his contacts and he was able to really determine what the needs uh, and values of the company were. And that really best positioned him for the position he's in right now in their IT services area, right, John? The other thing John was able to do in his role as consultant 
was to determine uh, who his competition was, and believe me, there wasn't much. He really was the lead candidate almost from the beginning. And also he was able to determine if there might be any objections about, about his candidacy. And again, there really weren't any. And I think most importantly, as John touched about at the end, he was able to show his new management uh, that he could be a real good negotiator and get the best possible offer on the table for himself. And uh, as we like to say in that role of consultant, um, he wasn't too quick to close the deal. And so he's really um, established himself and positioned himself um, for what I'm sure uh, Ernst & Young is going to see as one of their future leaders. And I'm pretty confident that we're looking at a future partner at Ernst & Young. Terrific job. Well, that's how it goes at the 5 o'clock club for those who are job searching. Of course, we also do executive coaching, but we can't have those people come up and because of confidentiality. Um, but let's take care of you. If you are in between jobs, if you are an unemployed HR professional, even if you are an outplacement elsewhere, well, of course, especially if you are an outplacement elsewhere, you should take care, you should take advantage of what we have to offer here. You come for free. We'll give you the books, the CDs, and free coaching. All you need to do is take out the blue form that's in the front of your folder, plop your name tag on it, and write in transition. Hand it in when you're leaving. And then we'll contact you about getting you into the coaching and getting the books to you and all of that sort of thing. If you are employed and would like to see the coaching in action, the coaching in action, not the private one-on-one -on -one coaching, but small group strategy sessions, I'll tell you, you will be blown away. Uh, you can be a fly on the wall at the club. Just do the same thing. Take your name tag, put it in, on here, and hand it in when you leave. Of course, don't mark any transition. But anyway, we'll come and we'll let you observe the actual coaching at the club. Um, and so you can be a fly on the wall and, and experience it for yourself. End of commercial about the 5 o'clock club. There are five seats on the stage. And, you know, if you would just file up right now, and Michael, if you would help people file up, and, and Miguel, if you would help people file up, they could sit on the stage, because guess what? There's going to be more people standing in the back, too, come, you know, who will be coming in late. So this is the time to come on up and grab a seat. You don't want to miss this from all the way back there. Okay. On June 17th, our next event is Hot Legal Issues That Affect HR. It's going to be a terrific topic. We'll let you know about it next week. I assure you that it will be enlightening and entertaining. So thank you for coming, and thank you for allowing us to be part of your professional lives. On with the main event, Rob Hellman, who you met earlier. He's VP and Associate Director of the Five O'Clock Club's National Guild of Career Coaches. He's going to moderate today's panel. Take notes. You have a notepad in your folder. You can follow along with the handouts from the speakers. And um, take it away, Rob. Here we go. Thanks, Kate. Hello, everybody. Just one more reminder in case you came in a little late, since this is a social media breakfast. Here is, oops, here's the hashtag for tweeting this conference, social HR. It's the hashtag if you're tweeting this conference. And if you tell people about uh, the event in, in your tweets, you can tell them they can get the handouts on our website. If they go to fiveoclockclub.com, look under events on the home page, they'll be able to get the handouts. So just want to let you know about that. And okay, let's uh, keep going. So anyway, I'm very excited about this topic today, how social media affects HR uses, abuses, and self-protection. It's such a timely topic given the news about Aflac and uh, Chrysler that we, some of you may have read about this week, about how they're trying to control their social media messages. And we're really lucky to have a great panel. We have uh, a social media group guru, Steve Ehrlich. We have Jim Flynn, who's a social media legal expert. And we have Sean Avalos, who's a compliance manager who's developed the social media policy for a large company. Uh, their full bios are in your directory. So each of the panelists is going to get about 15 minutes to uh, share their knowledge with us. And then we're going to have a uh, Q&A. And I'd like to um, uh, introduce the first panelist. The first panelist will be Stephen Ehrlich, who's a global VP of client development and campus recruiting for TMP Worldwide. Steve is a social media guru in every sense of the word. Take it away, Steve. Oh, and Steve's handout is right here. It's in your packet. This is his handout, right there. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. Yep. Thank you. Uh, first, anybody who's a self-proclaimed social media expert is a liar. Um, so let's put that out there. 
Um, I was told I have 15 minutes. I should use it wisely. So what I'd like to do is have everybody introduce themselves one at a time. <laughs> okay. Um, I am a highly caffeinated New Yorker. Um, I'm going to spend the next 14 and a half minutes taking you very quickly through an overview of what social media really has done to user behavior and how we consume media. Um, what that hopefully will do is set up the conversation for Jim about legal implications and for seeing about actual implementation within an organization. So um, as I go through this, if there are questions, please raise your hand and ask, um, but I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, when we think about social media today and engaging audiences in the digital arena, we think that there really are four key pillars to engagement, um, all of which play very closely together. The first is search, which leads to social, um, which leads to mobile and to video. And all of these things end up being uh, demonstrated through convergence on multiple platforms. So I'll talk about that a little bit as we go through it. But user behavior has, has changed, and it's changed dramatically. We're in the midst of a paradigm shift that is driven by technology. If we think about it, how many of us remember when ATMs were first introduced, right? We're not going to go to an ATM. We're going to go see a teller. Guess what? We're in the same place we are uh, today with social media. I'm not going to use Facebook. I'm not going to use Twitter. My father is 71 years old. He has a Twitter feed, a Facebook page, an iPad, an iPhone, and a Blackberry. <laughs> and what he does with all of those is he says, come here, I need you to explain how to use them. <laughs> so my question to all of you, just to level set, how many people here tweet? Just raise your hand. Excellent. How many people are on Facebook? Okay. Anybody here watch YouTube videos? How many people have posted YouTube videos? Okay. So we're starting to see that adoption rates are significant. If, let's think about Web 1 for a second. Web 1 came along, and what it was was the digitization of everything that was in our public library. Somebody went out there and said, you know, we're going to take all that content, we're going to digitize it, there you go, you can search it. Well, Web 2 came along, and what it really did was it connected people to each other. It made six degrees of Kevin Bacon real. It allowed us to visualize relationships between and amongst individuals. And what happened then was all of a sudden people could say things to a much broader audience because they could see that their friends had said it, and I want to follow that chain of conversation. And that's when people in organizations went, uh-oh, we have a problem. And so as we think about the digitization of content and the, the democratization of access to it, what we've seen is that social media has empowered the individual to be just as powerful as a large corporation. I don't need millions of dollars to have a voice. In fact, there's an audience out there that may or may not care about what I have to say, but they do follow me. On Twitter, I have about 1,100 people that follow me. I don't know why, um, but they do. And, and ultimately, it's because I do a lot of public speaking like this. People will meet me and they'll follow me. But the point here is that I now have an audience. I have power. If you look at somebody who has uh, a Twitter feed inside an organization who's made a mistake, as we've seen in the news with Chrysler, with Aflac, um, it has significant reach and significant impact. Um, but what I'd like to talk about for a second is one of my heroes, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Some of you know who he is. I assume you, some of you have seen him in concert. Uh, I've seen him 97 times. It's true. Uh, and uh, October a year ago, he played at Giant Stadium because they were tearing down Giant Stadium. He was the last musical act to play. He had five shows. I went to all five brought my wife with me. Uh, and in the third show, he stood on stage and he said, I'm about to do something I've never done before. And at that moment, I pulled out my iPhone and I turned on the video and he said, I'm about to play Jailhouse Rock by Elvis Presley. And I have a video of him doing that. And as soon as he finished, I posted that video to Facebook and to YouTube. So all of a sudden now, that's just an example how every one of us is a publisher. We all have the opportunity to publish content, whether it's about our employer, ourselves, our social lives. And today, employers have no control over that. If you're in an organization today where you block access to social media, raise your hand. Okay. For those of you that raised your hands, do your employees have cell phones? <laughs> okay. Point made. So today, we live in the age of what I like to call the wired consumer. It's somebody who's always on. I have two cell phones. They're never off unless I'm on an airplane. If you've ever been on a flight and you've heard the flight attendant say, sir, sir, please turn off your phone, that's me. I'm on your plane. We're going somewhere together. Um, I'm addicted to my mobile devices. In fact, there was a story on NPR yesterday, actually on WNYC here in New York, about a young woman who won the Westinghouse, or sorry, placed second in what's now the Intel Science Competition. It used to be the Westinghouse Competition. And she did a project where she analyzed teens' addiction behaviors to mobile devices. And what she, what she found was that it's just like cocaine. People have the same withdrawal, same issues. So mobile devices are ubiquitous, and all of a sudden social media is ubiquitous, and the two of them are converging. So as we think about the wired consumer, what we have is this opportunity now to media snack. It's a term that's been coined in the industry. And we used to get up in the morning, we'd go to our front door. What was at our front door? Right, a newspaper. And that newspaper told us what happened in the world yesterday. 
And we'd go to work, we'd come home at night, we'd turn on the television, we'd watch Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather, whoever we watched. And that news broadcast would tell us what had happened while we were at work. But that's no longer the case. With ubiquitous digital media, not just social media, we can be on a conference call, log on to CNN.com, ESPN.com to check the NCAA scores, PerezHilton.com for the latest gossip, whatever it might be. I hear some people laughing about Perez, so I, I got you, Kate. Uh, <laughs> but, but the point here is that it's not just news anymore, it's information. It's information about potential employers, it's information about current employers. All of a sudden, now, that publisher has real power. And inside an organization, the challenge that we face today is that the, the legal profession, and Jim's going to address this, has not kept pace with social media. Case law has not kept pace. There are things happening now where you can't control employees and their messaging. So if we live in this ADD adult society where we have constant partial attention, the question really becomes how do we retain the attention of the audiences that we want? How do we harness it and, help, and use it to help ourselves? So this media revolution is significant. It's driven by technology. It's driven by social media. And, and if you think about the United States, what's really amazing is that the average person in this country sees between three and 5,000 advertising messages a day. So if we're trying to reach an audience with a message, whether it's an internal population to motivate them to do something, whether it's an external population because we want to recruit them and bring them into the organization, whatever it might be, we're competing for their attention. Now, Something like 97% of tweets go unretweeted or unread, and that's fine. Um, and I'm not just focused on Twitter here, but social media, you know, if you put something out there, how, actually, let me put it to you this way. Anybody here shop at Nordstrom's? Shoot, ladies been to the shoe department? Men been to the shoe department? Customer service at Nordstrom is amazing. If you have a great experience, you tell 10 people. If you have a bad experience, you tell 100 people. <laughs> and so what, what we've seen with social media is that opportunity to tell those 100 people. So um, the importance here for organizations is the atomization of their message. It's not about being on Twitter. It's not about being on Facebook. It's not about being on LinkedIn or YouTube. It's about being everywhere. Because there are people today, when I asked about Twitter, a lot of people didn't raise their hands. And if I'm trying to reach you and you're not on Twitter, why would I tweet to you? So ubiquity of messaging is important. Organizations need to figure out which social platforms are right for them and embrace them. And they have to have a social policy, a social media policy, which they're going to address later on. Mine is very simple. It's three words. Don't be stupid. <laughs> if we hire people and we bring them into organizations, we should trust them to do the right thing. We trust our employees to pick up the phone when our clients call. We trust our employees to go to meetings with our customers. You need to learn to embrace social media and trust them. I take the approach that the glass is half full, not half empty. Oftentimes people say to me, well, if we use social media, somebody's going to say something bad about us. Guess what? They already are. <laughs> and I say, you know, if there are 10 people who are complaining about you, great. That's just 10 squeaky wheels. They'll, they'll go away. If there's 1,000 people complaining about you, I say, even better. That's free research, right? Gives us the opportunity to fix a problem in, within our organizations that really is a problem. So again, social media has benefits, it has risks, it has opportunities. Uh, but the challenge today is, as we look at younger generations coming into the workforce, they were the ones that spurred the growth of Twitter, Facebook, mobile, all these things. But like I said, my dad's 71, he uses all these tools, and I jest, he actually does know how to use them. So these tools are now hitting every generation. It's not just a young kid thing, it's not a millennial thing. Every generation recognized the opportunities that we had with social media and started to embrace it. The challenge is that there's no way to manage it. It's sort of like herding cats. So as we think about it, how many of us remember in middle school science class, they poured the iron filings out on the table and they said, okay, here's your magnet, go figure it out. The task for organizations today is to be that magnet, to align those iron filings to get them moving in the right direction to communicate the message properly. Here's the scary thing. Um, you've heard the expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's actually what happens in Vegas stays on Facebook. <laughs> but, but more importantly, it's actually, it's actually what happens in Vegas stays on Google. And the search box on Google is the most powerful tool on the internet today. Nothing that you do is hidden. Uh, nothing that you do can be removed, and that's something that's important. I, I'm getting the five-minute sign, so I better get some more caffeine and go quickly. Um, but a, as you look at the growth rates on social media and you look at, at, at uh, Google, you have to remember that search, although it is not a social platform, is the gateway to search, uh, to social. Anything that takes place in social media will be indexed by Google. It will be found by Google. And now Google has created something called social search. What it allows you to do is to see things that your social circle has posted. So if you ever do a search on a Google page, you look at the very bottom, it'll say your social circle. Uh, you'll see what your friends are saying. 
And today what people care about not, is not manufactured messaging that an organization puts out. They care about organic messaging that comes from the people that they trust, their peers. And today, even if I don't know you, I trust your opinion more than the opinion of the organization. And that's something that's absolutely critical to take away. Um, what Facebook did, just to use them as the example, I mean, with you know, 590 million, almost 600 million users, um, they got really smart. They put this button out there called the like button, and it was on the Facebook page. And you could like something, and that's great. There's no dislike button. But what, Google got, uh, what Facebook did to get really smart was they took that button and they put it on the Internet. And so as you have social media within organizations today, your challenge is that if you have employees that you have not aligned yet and they're saying things about your organization that you don't like, somebody could like that. And the average number of friends that a Facebook user has is 130. All of a sudden, you remember that commercial for shampoo? You know, she told two friends and so on and so on and so on. That's Facebook. So you need to be able to get out there and control your messaging in an effective way. And the way you do that is not by clamping down on the individuals who are saying things that you don't like. It's by flooding Facebook and the social spaces with authentic, transparent, positive stories. Because they will overshadow the negative commentary. As individuals, you need to figure out how to use social media for your own job searches, for your own career development, etc. But Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter have fundamentally changed the way we communicate as individuals. My brother, who is 17 years younger than I am, um, does not talk to me on the telephone. I will call him. I will leave him a voicemail. I will text him. He will not respond. The only way he responds to me is via Twitter. And that's true. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just a different thing. And as individuals, we need to start adjusting to that. What's really critical about social media is participation. So again, you know, Rob pointed out that you've got to put the social media hashtag out there. We've got to get people to engage, to share the message, share the story. You've got to do that within your own organizations, within your own lives. Um, but the problem here is trust. Um, there's an inverse relationship between control and trust. In organizations, they're unwilling to give up control, but they want people to trust them. And what you're going to find is that indiv individuals within organizations are going to have to be empowered. You're going to have to give them control of the message because you may build your brand, but it lives outside your organization today. Um, to move very quickly, um, the idea here is that everybody is a publisher. Everybody can tell stories. Stories are what drive organizations. Anthropologists have determined that 70% of what we learn as human beings comes through storytelling. We tell children stories in school. We tell them stories at bedtime. We tell them for didactic purposes. You need to begin to find those stories within your organizations, within your own career trajectories, and start telling them. And the same way that, that um, our first speaker was coached on how to tell his story, that's what we want to do with you in the social spaces. Social media technology is new. Social is not new as a concept. For 25,000 years, we have been social human beings. We tell stories, cave paintings at Lascaux, things like that. So again, as you think about social and its implications, the world has changed. What you're going to hear from the next speaker is what that means in terms of the legal issues that organizations face. I have 60 seconds left, so I'm going to move very quickly. What my last bit here to, um, to leave you with is a thought about Mr. Springsteen. If you've seen him in concert, he puts on one of the greatest shows in the history of rock and roll. I remember seeing him in the early 80s when he'd play for four and a half hours and the place would go bananas. What he did was he created an experience that was worth sharing. I would go out and tell somebody about it. I've seen him 97 times. I tell people about every show that I've been to. Inside our organizations, in our own careers, we need to create experiences that are worth sharing. You need to add value to your colleagues. You need to go and say, how can I help you? That's an experience that's worth sharing. They'll tell your story. Within your organization, you need to create those experiences. So I thank you. I'll hand it over to Jim because my time is up.